as we discuss the local violins from the Rogue Valley and around. Um, these violins I'll show you are the ones we'll be demonstrating. Morgan O'Shaughnessy will demonstrate these instruments. You get to see the, the color and the sound of all these various instruments. It's so wonderful to have so many local instruments. This is uh, Ernest, uh, Ernest Wickham, lives at the manor. Uh, it's a bent wood top and backs, non-traditional figure eight style like a guitar. This one's Michael Scott and uh, Tequila Organ, 2010. Beautiful local maple. Michael's a very good woodworker and it came uh, to fiddle making not from a fiddle, from a woodworking tradition rather than fiddle making. Of course, so did Stradivarius. <laughs> um, Sorry, this is Howard Sands, who came with us today, and this was 2007. Beautiful uh, figure on this, the, the uh, Oregon um, Big Leaf Maple. Very nice. This viola is um, wood from Shady Cove from Tepper. And uh, it's a Victor Gardner viola. Victor was the teacher of everyone. And a very wonderful uh, figured back, not just violin, but um, not fiddle back, but uh, just a figured quilted maple. Very nice. Let's see, this was 2006 by John Hill, local Medford maker. Very good work. Beautiful Bosnian maple neck. Very fine scroll work. The violin's often judged by the, the carving of the scroll. <laughs> um, David Sliger, uh, 1988. Uh, student of both, um, let's see, David Gusset up in Eugene and uh, Joseph Grumbach down in Petaluma. One piece back. Um, it looks like big leaf maple too. Very beautiful. Spruce top. And young Alex Pictenica. Um, let's see, this one, well, he's not yet labeled it. Brand new off the press. Beautiful red color. Um, incredible carver. Okay, and then this cello is Michael Klein. Uh, Michael makes all his parts, as Victor did, Michael's main students, but uh, this is a very rare piece of maple. <laughs> this is a one piece back of big leaf maple. Unheard of. <laughs> Really, very quite something. And uh, local um, Engelman spruce top as well. All right? Usually at this time of year, or at least for many years in the past, Morgan and I have been in Jacksonville starting at 8 in the morning. And so, being the year of the monkey, <laughs> we thought we'd bring a little bit of the uh, Chinese festivities to you. I understand that there's a display also with Chinese instruments here, so we're just adding to the royalment. Now, oh, we're down? Okay, because I can't. <laughs> All right, oh yes, yes. Um, I don't have my right glasses, so this should be very entertaining. For the most part, Morgan, Morgan O'Shaughnessy, who, uh, um, with, uh, a Gasky boy, um, and then made his way down to the conservatory in San Francisco, got his uh, degree there. He's incredible. He plays, he's up here for this weekend to play viola in the symphony. He worked with me in the shop uh, for four years and made a wonderful shop manual. He's helped me considerably. He's a musician extraordinaire. Well, 750 today. They live at the university. Uh, I take care of them for the university and we have a few of the pieces here today and this is kind of why Morgan's here a little bit as well 
but he, he can play, though he is a violist, he can play violin, fiddle, and we'll talk about the difference between the two of them. And what we intend to do today um, is just go through a little bit about the history of the local makers. As far as I know, it's, it's this much and this much, and uh, we'll go there. But shall we, uh, uh, shall we do, do a little thing? So I'm playing an unusual looking instrument called an arhu. It is a ancient Chinese stringed instrument, sort of a fiddle, and I first saw them being played in the streets of San Francisco. Actually, it's really quite neat to be wandering around a foggy city and you hear this mysterious kind of silky, wobbly sound. And this one, this one is part of the Schumann collection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, the arhu is pretty much, we wouldn't have the fiddle unless we had the arhu. The, uh, the Chinese tradition of the fiddle, the horsehair, the bow, all becomes from the Mongolian tribes. It's called a knee fiddle or a spike fiddle. And uh, it's really, its way through the Mideast and everything else ends up into Europe and ends up turning into a violin. So a very fascinating history, but it all has to do with the horsehair bow. Okay, uh, this is a gusla. Um, this is a southern Chinese instrument. We're trying to replicate some of the music that perhaps in, in our days doing the music we had a band called Who's Who. Uh, um, who means kind of barbarian, so uh, in the Chinese line. We had a band and we're trying to recreate the music of the air. So where music came in Jacksonville from the Chinese would have been at the New Year's. And we have, uh, Chinese weren't great drinkers, but they, they did have their opium now and then, but they were gamblers and they loved to celebrate New Year's. So we have uh, cases in history all up and down the uh, uh, coast uh, from the gold mining era of the celebrations, the theatrical celebrations. Chinese opera is what they, the term we use now, but it was the theatrical celebrations surrounding the New Year. And so these are instruments that possibly could have shown up with Jacksonville. We just don't have any iconography to prove that, but we do in the Bay Area, and we do in California, we do north of here. So anyway, so uh, a few pieces from the period. Okay. Okay. We always think the bagpipe's Western. <laughs> this is called a ditzy. Hang on, I gotta get my. It's kind of like a flute and a kazoo all at once. <laughs> um, hang on, this thing's so small.
All right. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Morgan. Um, no, it, it has a membrane. So a piece of bamboo has a, um, a sheath of skin on the inside of that, which typically we throw away. They pull that out and then they paste it on. There's an extra hole in the flute and they paste it on the outside with, with um, well, with kind of garlic paste, <laughs> believe it or not. And they paste this on the outside and it, and it creates that kazoo sound. And uh, this is a reed instrument, and just bamboo reeds in here. That I expected to hear a Middle Eastern nasally. Well, but that's kind of, yeah. So uh, China is so full of so many cultures that we always kind of China, and it's not just China. It's just like so massive. Anyway, uh, do I have a clicker? Do you want to be my clicker? Who? Somebody's going to click for me? <laughs> um, you're my clicker. OK. Um, I've had my, I came to Ashland, Oregon 40 years ago to play with the Shakespeare Festival. I play Renaissance music. I don't play violin, but I play viola da gamba. I play many, many wind instruments. I sing whatever. I do whatever they tell me to. Or I did. I don't anymore, <laughs> or rarely. Um, I fell in love with Ashland. It was so wonderful. And in the whole area, the Rogue Valley, the mountains, the, I just loved it here. And so how do you make a living here? I ended up going off to Europe and figuring it out. And I came back as a recorder maker. I made recorders for 20 years and starved, but that's life. I sold to everybody locally, and then now what do you do? <laughs> um, and then I also found the one truth that recorders wear out. It's a wind instrument. They don't last forever. Violins last forever. My family had been in the violin. My great-grandfather uh, brought John Hornsteiner over from Europe and established one of the leading shops in Chicago in the teens, in the 19, about 1915. And that shop lasted through around 25 until it burned up in a fire, but not the Chicago fire. Our, our personal Chicago fire. So I was always surrounded by lore of violins and all the stories, the strads, the Amatis that were family instruments and that got stolen or, yeah. You know. I, I loved musical instruments. At around 18, I started making, uh, getting my hands on any musical instrument, wind, string, anything, and learning to work with it and play with it and, you know, mess around. More, um, well, I wanted to do everything, but I loved musical instruments. When I came here, I, I did a lot. I went to schools, went everywhere, but found out that what works for me is my eyes are really good. I see perfect right here, and they say it's going to stay there. So I'm very blessed because everybody in the shop has getting hold over these close-ups, and they can't see this, and I can, and that's how I can work on it. So it's my saving grace. Being far, uh, being nearsighted, really helps me considerably, and I have enough ear to carry me through. I don't have the discipline or chops of a musician. I play with the Jefferson Baroque uh, Orchestra. I'm more their, uh, you're the monkey. <laughs> I, I play anything they tell me to, and I love it, but I'm not their leading proponent. <laughs> but I bring all these instruments from the Schumann collection in, and they like that part of it. Um, so I've had my shop, Bellwood Violin, we've run for 30 years now. This is, our, uh, this is my 30th year in business here, and we're doing fine. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, but I've had all these fiddles come in, and I've met all these local fiddle makers, and I wish I started taking notes earlier, and I just didn't. So there's going to be tons of them that are missing, but this is who I have record of. And I don't, uh, there's a couple of people here I don't really know, but I, I found them on the internet, so they must be real. <laughs> uh, fascinating selection of instruments that belong to the museum here. Uh, what I can say is, um, there's a different styles, and everybody's going to say, what's a fiddle, what's a violin? Well, this area was, this is a very familiar, I mean, you don't know these people, but this is a familiar pi picture 150 years ago. We were our own musician, and the fiddle was a great dance instrument. I mean, everybody, everybody in this local area, anywhere, as people came here, you needed that. That, that was our radio. That was everything. And so the fiddle became very portable. Anybody can make one. What's the difference between a violin and a fiddle? Well, a fiddle is, might, there's nothing really, but a fiddle can be a little more improv. It doesn't have to fit to the, to the mold, you know? And a lot of the fiddles that we have, and we'll talk about this as we go on, are, you know, Grandpa Joe's attempt to copy 
the instrument that somebody had got from Europe, you know, and so it's very fascinating. Anyway, um, let's let's go on to the the next next slide here. Um, Louis Alexander Southworth, very interesting. The first fiddle uh, player in the area I found records of. Now he. He basically came with his master, he's a slave at this point, came with his master and paid and earned $300 in the, in the years he worked in Jacksonville and to pay off his freedom. And, but he supported his master. So he did all the work and he's just trying to pay off his freedom. But he was a fiddler, there's a quote that I don't have, but it was like to them, to the P, the miners are quoted as saying that, uh, you know, life here in the mines is hard. And, and the vulgarity and everything, it's just an intense life. But he's the church we have, you know, he's our church. When he brings out his fiddle, that's our church. And so this is Jacksonville, this is what we're going through. So very interesting that we see a black man in Jacksonville, one, you know, and that, um, anyway, fascinating story. There's a lot of story about him. Of course, he moved a lot of places, but he was in Jacksonville during this time and working in the mines. Um, <laughs> The more careful, he didn't make violins. Everybody else from now on will be, will, will be uh, makers. George Craspy, uh, uh, and that's Alice. <laughs> George, uh, I, if you go up to 66 and the Green Springs, there's an old gas station there you have to go around. He, he lived there with Alice, and Alice was the entertainment. So you come get your gas pumped, and Alice would get on on her skates or something. Well, George made fiddles for 50 years. I mean, he made a lot of fiddles, and that was, it was kind of a hobby. And who made fiddles? Sometimes they're fiddle makers, and sometimes you just make one for yourself because you can't afford one. And you copy something, and some people are better than others. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, but George had a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, very entertaining life. I, I think uh, Alice bit him once or something and he had to let go of Alice. But he eventually retired into Ashland and uh, came down off the mountain. Um, but made um, 50, 50 fiddles is a, is a lot. Okay, next please. Okay, now one of the first stories I heard were the Applegate fiddles. Well, this is interesting, you know, local history. Well, it turns out that George Buck, who's, um, his dad was the pioneer anyway, and they established in uh, Ancala. I think they had the family estate. And these are pictures of where they lived. So he originally got, oh, um, Henny, 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 Henny. There was, a, there was a gambler violinist, fiddle player, who played for all the dances in the, the late part of the 19th century through the area. And he was a notorious gambler, he was just whatever, a swindler and stuff, but he had this German violin. And it was in the, uh, I say the Hoff or the Amati style. We have one back there that's in the Hoff style. Now, a violin has a label on it, don't believe it. <laughs> but it does sometimes indicate a little bit about its history. It's the style it's made in. There's different styles of violins. So a lot of the fiddlers uh, copied this early Hoff or a Mahdi style, which is an earlier style than the Strad, but very weak corners and maybe elongated and stuff. So these were both copies, his copies, he made these when he was 20. He made two for his, he's 20 and he's making, or 21, and he's making them for his twin daughters, okay? But the fiddle he's copying is his sister's boyfriend, who's the notorious guy. Um, but anyway, very interesting. The one he got had carving in it, and that's not uncommon. Well, it's, it is uncommon, but not that uncommon of having a little bit of inlay put in the back. It's not great acoustically, but there you have it. This one's very beautiful wood. This is something about our local wood. Next, please. Okay, this is one that's sitting in the back. You'll look there. I, I should have brought some strings. <laughs> This, again, is this more, um, I call them sausage-shaped violins more. Um, it's not the Stradivarius. It doesn't have the sharp, defined corners of the Stradivarius style. Um, but it, it's, and it's all, the, these, are, these were copied from instruments where the corners had worn out, so the older Amati instruments, and then the Germans started producing them. So, and these, and most of the American fiddles were a lot copied after these German instruments. So there's some things you can tell about the instrument. Anyway, Skeeter's also made instruments for 50 years. He was born in Jacksonville, um, and he played everywhere. He's a great player, played for, for years. Um, so he started, let's see, well, died in 51 if he made for 50 years. 
made quite a few fiddles. I don't, we don't have a number, um, uh, and, but there are a few around and I've seen a few in the shop. So that's kind of neat. Okay, uh, next please. <laughs> this is funny. So why fiddles, why Rogue Valley? Well, fiddles are everywhere in America. But one of the things that makes this area famous is the wood. Uh, this last year I went to the Boston Early Music Festival and it was great and well, lo and behold I go in the exposition hall and here's all these guys. I recognize that wood. It's all, they're all using Rogue Valley wood. Yeah. And it's just, you're kidding. <laughs> because here in the Rogue Valley we want to use the European wood. <laughs> well, it's not all, the, the later, the last school of makers here, the, the newest school. Uh, but yeah, this wood, some of the prettiest on earth. It's the, the figured maple here is just incredible. It's high in demand. Unfortunately, a lot of it's going out to electric guitars. Can you imagine? It could be violins. Uh, but it makes, it, the violins are eh, but the cellos, I mean, they're okay. I mean, I'm not saying that. They're great fiddles and they're good instruments. Uh, but it makes incredible cellos and violas. I mean, just incredible. So these are, uh, one of the guys, Victor Gardner, he, uh, we'll talk about him in a minute. He, he brought in everybody. Everybody all over the country came here. He showed them how to fell trees. And basically, he would say, he'd get your permit and stuff and say, go. Here's your permit. Here's your, this is what you're going to do. You're going to fall a lot of branches on so it has a place to fall and go do it. <laughs> he'd set them up and let them do the first one. They need help. And uh, um, so, and one of Victor's friends was, uh, G um, uh, I called him old man Tepper. John, his son John's doing it now. John's out uh, in Shady Cove. The Tepper complex is out there. Um, and they, they have an amazing wood selection. This is, this is, the Tepper archives. It's just, I mean, they got rooms and rooms and rooms of this violin wood, and they're selling it all over Europe. Matter of fact, if I go and online and I buy a piece of German spruce, I'm probably getting Rogue Valley spruce from the Teppers. Interesting. <laughs> but, well, maple, okay, so that's good. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a little slow on this. Uh, the top, the soundboard, is spruce, and these are Engelman. Engelman's what we have best of, but we have other spruces as well. The back and the scroll on the neck are, are big leaf maple, or maple, and of all violins. So it's always the violin spruce. Not all violins, matter of fact, Skeeters, uh, who we looked at a minute, use all the local woods, which is fun, because there's walnut, there's all these different woods that are really wonderful, yeah. Is the Sitka spruce from here any different? Yes, no, no. Well, our, no, we're in the same family, so yeah, I'd rather higher elevations what's important. So the, you know, stuff up in the mountain range around us, that's better stuff than on the valley. Same thing, the stuff on the coast in Alaska is not as good as the stuff up high. It's uh, more that the, the weather has gotten at it. You know, the harder life it's had, the better it is. Now, every, not every maple tree has that wonderful figure. Uh, let's wear something. Well, there's a... That's very figured. Um, somebody, oh, okay, so very tight grain and stuff. Not, um, we call it fiddleback maple, believe it or not. And not every maple tree has that, but that's the ones you want to cut, or the ones that do. Yes? Does the higher make it harder? It just makes it grow slower, so the grain lines get tighter. Yeah, so there's less growth between winter and summer, so we don't have these wide grain lines. And, and um, yeah, that's a little, yeah. No, no, it's not. If any tree that has branches, it will always have figuring underneath. It's muscle, if you think of it that way. So maybe, maybe the trees that sway more have more, who knows? We're not sure why whole trees have it. We haven't figured it out, but we do know that that type of, of um, is like under the branches and stuff, that type of figuring and stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, no, they will find the whole tree. They'll do bore, they'll drill the tree, they'll find the bore, and then they'll take the whole tree. And um, I mean, well, Michael Klein, Victor's student, ended up getting a tree like a maple this big. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, made one piece cello backs, unheard of. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Uh, and sometimes violins have one piece back, sometimes they have two piece backs. Um, I don't know if we have any. There's a one piece back, okay. And let me see if a pretty one, it's, uh, there you could, s well there's a local, yeah. 
It's two piece, so and they book match it. So they, they cut the, uh, they, they split the wood into wedges and then cure it five to 20 years, okay, minimum. And then from those wedges, they split that in half and then you open it up and that's called book matching. And, and if you're good, you plane it true and then you just put a little high glue on there and it's done. It's if you've got the, if you've got the magic. Anyway, so this is, this is Tepper, some of Tepper's storage and these are again, Victor's students cutting wood, uh, Victor cutting a tree, very blurred. I think that's with Michael Klein. Um, they used to do it, you know, it used to cost $10. They'd take a year, but you get a $10 permit to go cut a, 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 a Engelman. Or, and the maple was similar, but you'd usually, that'd be on the flatlands, private property. Uh, Jim Hoots, this <laughs> old man Tepper. I, my shop's on Hersey Street in Ashland. Um, one of the makers used to be on Oak Street was Jim Hoots. Now there's a couple other makers downtown, I for, can't remember so much, but Jim Hoots, he had gone to Arizona and won awards. He had a, he was a, he played bluegrass. He was an incredible bluegrass local player, played in one of the local bands. They played everywhere for the Valley for years. And he made great, beautiful, thick varnish, but he made incredibly beautiful, lush, you just see right through and right into the wood, you know, into the depth of wood. Beautiful looking instruments, um, and he used local wood and stuff, but at one point, and Copper is where the Applegate, the town of Copper was where the Applegate Lake is now. Well, when they decided to make the lake, they log, somebody got the contract to log the lake. Well, the fiddle people got, to those the, who's the logging, which all the, I mean, uh, um, Tepper was a logger first, as were Victor Gardner. You know, they spent most of their life doing that. And uh, they had arranged uh, for the people they're logging to leave all the maples at eight feet. And um, so they could have the bottom sections and just go through afterwards. And so that was good and it was planned for, a, for a, they were going to go clean it up on a Saturday, you know, on a Saturday. Well, uh, Friday night, Hoots and his gang, so there were gangs of fiddle makers. <laughs> Hoots and his gangs went in at night and stole all the wood. Oh now I have a lot of that at my shop <laughs> because Hoots is long gone. But uh, you know, and I just you know, okay. But it's it's a funny history. It's it's violin. It's not many people. I I give it away, you know, for people to to work on to try. I mean, Hoots had a good system, and he 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 was pretty neat, but. Um, he, they were, they were fiddles. They were a little heavy in the varnish for a classical instrument, but beautiful, just incredibly beautiful. Uh, but anyway, and I'm not even positive it was, it was Tepper, but that's, you know, Jim Hoots kind of gave me a funny story. I heard the story from Hoots, so <laughs> it's very interesting. The gang of fiddle makers, next please. Victor Gardner is, look at this, 405 violins and violas and 108 cellos. Victor, as it was an Italian, uh, whatever, had Italian, was born here, born in, uh, in, the, in the valley, but was, uh, had an uh, Italian background, ancestors, and he got interested in fiddles as a kid, but you know, I, the story is, I, there's stories, so I'm not sure, but it sounded like maybe he made one as a kid. But after he retired from his career, as, uh, he did equipment, big equipment, logging, a lot of different things, he started making instruments. He had 10 students. Um, and they all did quite well, and we'll talk about his students in a minute. Um, the violins, you would have to write a letter to get an instrument from him, explaining why you wanted. This was before, this is where the German instruments were here, but it was before the Chinese instruments came. Violins have always followed the, uh, the, the history of the economy. It was in Italy, it was kind of born in Cremona, Italy, when Italy was under Spanish rule and just totally broke, okay? So labor is cheap. But the instruments that came out of there today are worth millions. <laughs> the ones that have survived, and they're just, most of the workmanship was un unmatchable. Uh, followed by the French after the revolution. Again, the economy shot, how do we make money? But there's this, there's a new, when the economy goes, there's a need for music, there's a need for the arts. Uh, it went to Germany after that. When Germany fell, it went to Eastern Europe. When Eastern Europe kind of like, yeah, well, anyway, it ended up in China, and it took a number of years before China, Chinese carvers who had carved for fifth and five, six generations. I mean, incredible carvers can do anything, but it took a number of years before they could get it, and now there's some incredible instruments coming out of China. So 
it's not where the instrument's coming from. There's world-class instruments, and world-class instruments started around 30,000, coming out of every corner of the earth. And the schools in Italy, you know, there's Chinese, everybody's mixed up, so it's not place of origin. Uh, obviously, the most expensive instruments are coming from Cremona, but that just has to do with history. You know, I mean, the most modern instruments. So the 30,000 uh, you would get here, you would get 40 there. So, interesting. Uh, modern makers, I think the uh, 50 or 60,000, I think, uh, has been kind of the record for a modern maker getting. But as far as the old makers, the antiques and stuff, I mean, it's, uh, well, there's a cello by Stradivarius that was supposed sold to China or to Japan for 50 million. I've had a $4 million cello in the shop. It's interesting. Anyway, let's look at Victor's students. Victor was amazing. He took, he made everything, all the parts. He did it from scratch and he taught all these students. And he would, he would start at, you know, he would start at six in the morning, work till nine at night. And oh, the violins were $100. This is in the 80s. The violins were $100, violas were $200, and the cellos were $1,000. Good luck. The violins I sell for about two thousand when they come through the shop, two to twenty-five, and I've and they're beautiful. Oh, just he just the best wood. The violas are priceless. You cannot buy one. <laughs> they sounded so good. Everybody wants them. What happened with Victor? He ran into a guy. Um, he had some instruments up at U of O, and there was a fire, and so they had to put out all the instruments on the lawn to get them out of the music department. And this guy, Hans Weishard, who had studied under the best in e Europe and East Coast and stuff, and had a shop in LA, had, had seen him and was just very impressed. So he took Victor under his wing. And uh, so Victor had some very good training. And uh, Hans Weishard really kind of wrote the Bible on violin repair and stuff like that. But anyway, and had worked with Viom and some very famous people. Victor did a great job. Okay, next please. Um, one of Victor's students is David Dunn. We have one of David Dunn's violas here. This is a cello that he did. Um, this is local wood. Uh, David's classical player, when I came here, he was playing in the symphony. Uh, very much in your face, very romantic, uh, aggressive player, very good. And toward the end, the incredible looking instruments. He's still alive, but he's not making much anymore. Um, he lives up in... Um, Sunny Valley. Sunny Valley, thank you. Next, please. Victor's student that made the biggest thing is Chris uh, Dungy, Dungy. Uh, local born boy. He's on the East Coast now, but he's really made a name for himself. He's probably, of all the local makers, he's making the most. Now, Lynn Harrell, who's a $4 million cello I've uh, worked on in the shop, that he was playing at Brit and had an open seam or something. He's the neatest guy. But uh, he makes, Chris is his personal luthier, you know, whatever. He makes his modern. So you often have this, Morgan said this the other day on the radio. You have these old antiques and they're great, but they're, they're a little bit troublesome to play. So your regular gig instrument, you know, you bring them out for the concert hall, but then your regular gig is a local instrument, the one you practice on. And Chris makes his instrument. So anyway, beautiful workmanship. Uh, this is local wood. Okay, next please. Carlish. Uh, Shapiro, very interesting, another one of Victor's students. She went on to get her law degree, she's in Berkeley, and she's the foremost uh, leading uh, American authority on violin fraud and has written books and stuff. She's also, internationally, she's known for her work with um, uh, Holocaust instruments, getting them back into families, instruments that were absconded with during the Holocaust and stuff, and she's incredible, but this is very good work, again, local wood. She just has fond memories of Victor in doing that, but she became, she's made a name, established a name for herself. Next, please. Um, Charles Harmon, now he lives out on the coast. Um, we, I had a viola, I, we brought so many things, I forgot to bring it, but we, we have one of his in the shop. Um, and uh, he's a dentist by trade, retired. He and his son have made instruments on the coast for quite a few years. Very interesting research, the viola, and gets this very dark sound. Um, he's interesting work, not the most refined, though his cellos and violas, again, local wood, it, there's something there. And he gets this incredible sound of them. So that's neat. Uh, next, please. Um, Howard Sands lived, uh, 
lived next door to Victor. <laughs> so he kind of just took it on himself and he's made a number of, a good number of instruments. Uh, his work's clean, very clean. We have, we have a few in the shop. There's one here. I think we have three. I think we have a viola too in the shop, but I, have a vi I brought a violin, a sampling of it. Um, neat guy. Anyway, next. Okay, but Victor's main, or the person who Victor gave his shop to was Michael Klein. Michael Klein had his violin on his car, backed up and ran over his violin. I don't know what I do. So he goes to Victor and he says, can you help me out? Victor says, no, but I'll show you how to make violins. Vi Michael had been, uh, uh, worked in cabinetry and stuff and so knew his way around a plane and everything. And so he took on, uh, I'm sorry the picture is so blurry. He, it's just he's working real fast. It was hard to get. <laughs> <laughs> it's the internet. Um, uh, he lives out in, um, in Williams and uh, beautiful shop, beautiful. And he again starts from the tree, does all his parts. Uh, we have this cellos by Michael here. Uh, incredible work. He hasn't got, didn't quite get the numbers that Victor got. Uh, he has a hobby of making hot rods and stuff, so he likes that too. But uh, he started a school in Victor's honor and taught a lot of people. So he um, had a school you'd go during the weekends. I did, I did the first class just to see how it'd be. It was so much fun. He has a, built a timber frame shop and we all worked there and there was no power tools and just here, whoosh, whoosh to the plane, you know, and everybody's, oh, it was such a treat. I really, it really rebirthed, it was like, you know, it was maybe 15 years ago or 20 years ago, and it just really regenerated my interest in everything. It was just wonderful. Um, so, and yeah, in violin making, a millimeter is a mile, and the width of a pencil is a lot. We don't, it's not rocket science, it's harder. No, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. Um, I, uh, the youngest maker I'll talk about is Alex Botinica, and he came, he came, well, anyway, he doesn't measure anything to the end. He just does it by eye, and they teach him how to do it with the width of a pencil. <laughs> it's pretty fascinating. It's a different art. Michael's an amazing guy, and he's, he's semi-retired. He just make a, made a fortune. He had all Victor's old wood, and he had his, and the school went for years, and then he closed the school. And, uh, and then he sold all the wood to the Chinese, and they loved it. <laughs> of course, he had all these one-piece uh, cello back, but Michael's a horse trader, so he highballed it, and they paid it. So, wow. So Michael's in a happy retirement. I always wonder how you retire from the trade. <laughs> but he's still making. He's still saved enough wood. To, he makes beautiful cellos and violins, and he just very good. And his shop's just wonderful to go out to see. OK, next, please. Um, so these are. A uh, oh, I, a few of Michael's students. Sorry, I threw somebody else in the end. In the end, when uh, when I went to take Michael's first class, John Hill was there, Buck was there. Um, who was that? Somebody from the uh, Applegate who was a he was another doctor or something. He was making a viola. I can't think of Ar Ar Arthur. Um, anyway, can't think of his name. Buck lives as a farmer up in uh, Madrid. He would come down and and. Uh, work on the instruments. He met Michael, he came down one of the uh, Thanksgiving weekends to Ashland and uh, saw Michael was at the Woodworking Guild and saw his violins and then Michael started up this school so he was one of the first there and there's his first cello he's very proud of but he's done very well. He's created a, yes? I was curious like how the curve on the top of the uh, instrument is I can see on some of them. It's carved. It's well, except for one violin, it's all carved. So it's it's a big. You end up with a. We put the wedges together, so you end up with a piece of wood about that thick in the middle on the cello to about that, and then it's all hand carved. So the arching's everything. It's just how it's arched makes the sound. And then it's and then you flip it upside down, and then you carve out the inside. So yeah. Um, yeah, so there's, and you make a form. When you make it, you make the outside around a form. You glue the blocks and you make the outside around the form. Then you pop the form out and then you glue the top and the back on. Uh, John Hill is done. He has a shop in Medford, well, out of his home, but he's, uh, he's my main competition in town. <laughs> he's done a great job. He's very good. He took a vacation, a uh, sabbatical a few years, but uh, he's back at it. Uh, beautiful instruments. We have one of his here today. Um, 
yeah, I, you know, he's more of a fiddler as a player, but I don't know if he's, he's what he's good at as a singer-songwriter. He's very good. But he was somebody who started with Michael, but then John, as David Dunn, who I mentioned earlier, both of them went to John Harrison. John Harrison's in Reading, and he has won a lot of tone awards in the Violin Society of America and stuff. So they both went from off to him later. You know, uh, David Dunn from Victor, and then um, John with Michael. So they always attribute as, as, as uh, John Harrison as their teacher. But John was part of that class early on. Chet Bishop, I haven't met, <laughs> but he's in Williams, and he's he was one of the and he obviously he's a he's beautiful instrument, but he's put out a shingle online at least. So uh, and there was a number of other students. I just I've seen some of their instruments. We've had them in the shop, but nothing nothing that really stands out. But um, if you know, I have lots of cards with me. If you know anybody local, let me know because I am trying to put this history together. This is a work in progress. Next, please. Um, so I have a violin shop, and I have for all these years, and I've had a number of people come in and start their own business. I've had a few guitar people as well, but we will mention there. Um, Doug Hayden came in, and uh, it turned out we'd worked in the same, I did an apprentice, a European apprenticeship in a bike shop as a kid, and we worked in the same shop, didn't recognize him, but he came in to have me lower his action on the bass, and it was already lower than anything I'd seen, but we made it better. And he now has a shop up in Eugene, and he specifically deals with basses and some cellos, and that's one of the basses he made. Um, he's very good. Um, Jacob Mariani, he's now in Europe. Um, this is a little teeny instrument, kind of like this one here. Uh, he specializes in pre-Renaissance instruments, medieval instruments, and up into the early Renaissance. Uh, he's a young guy, he worked for me, and then he went to Charlie Ogle. I think he already, he'd come to Ashland, he already had his composition degree in music, and he was studying Russian artwork and he needed a job, so we hired him on, and then within the year he was making instruments, and he's just taking off and doing some uh, leading edge research in Europe and stuff, and he just got accepted to Oxford. Oxford. So, and he's already, see, so he did his master's of U of O, studied with Charlie Ogo, who's a viola, viola maker, uh, viola de gamba, gamba, leg, viola de leg, even the little ones you play on your leg, this type. And, uh, and he got a degree in Basel, where a place I studied in Switzerland uh, at the Scuola Cantorum. And then he's now, now, yeah, Oxford, wow. Alex Botinica is our shining star. Uh, <laughs> Alex is somebody who started it. Uh, his dad's, a, let's see, his dad's a ranger, one of the rangers, or the marine biologist at Crater Lake. So he's the guy who goes down in the submarine. And uh, was homeschooled, uh, brilliant kid, uh, never took a high school class, but took, you know, uh, advanced Spanish and, and, and uh, let's see, calculus and everything at the university. His dad also taught at the university. Um, he came to me when he was 12 and worked till he was 18 and went off to Cremona to the school, the school, um, I can't think of the Italian name for that. Do you know what it is? Let's go ahead. Um, You're the Italian speaker. <laughs> well, it's, it's something that Lutai So it's Strat it's, it's in the town of Stradivarius and the Madi. It's the great Italian makers, the home of them. And there's still a school there, and so we sent him off there. He spent his time, he learned his Italian. Of course, the second half of his learning was interesting. He spent three months in Mexico, uh, surfing, thinking that if I could just get Spanish, I'll have the, <laughs> the Italian. Well, it worked. And he spent, then he went to, sp lived in Italy for, for the teacher here who was studying with. He lived with a friend of theirs for three months and uh, went to the only high school he did in his life. And so he was teaching English in an Italian high school and, and learning history. I mean, it was very interesting. Um, but he did the three months and then he got into school. He was the youngest person. Uh, accepted in. It was uh, 50 applicants. They took 15 or three or I don't know, some very small number, but he got in. Um, and he's, he's an incredible player. He's been playing since he's three. He's a classical player, but now he kind of started losing interest and now he's doing Phil stuff and he's loving it. And um, But he's fast. He's got what it'll take. We have one of his instruments here. He will outdo all, us all. What? Yeah, he's he, yeah he's in the shop. You'll he's covered with dreads. Least likely violin person. People don't. Re he showed at the Woodcraft Guild this year, and one of the participants went over to Tom, the director, and said, "You know, I'm I'm a little bit worried about that kid in the 
he just sits there and, and, and you, know, you know, they were all worried. You know, he doesn't look the part, but he is an incredible craftsman. He's probably the best carver in the valley. Although, mind you, he just does violins. But he does it so, I mean, he does it so precisely. And like I say, he does it by, they taught him how to do it by eye. And, but it's very precise. You could set your, you know, 0 .003 millimeters. I mean, it's accurate. But um, incredible. Anyway, and he's working now, so he's refining, he's fine, he's working on varnish and everything. He makes his own varnish and everything. So he's back at the shop after his years. He got a master's in making, a master's degree of what they give. It's kind of a trade school thing uh, from Italy. And then he, uh, now he's back at the shop. He makes half time and he does repair for the shop half time. Um, so anyway, Alex is our star and he'll go far. Anyway, next please. Um, there's tons of amateur makers. Uh, we just lost Phil Fry, and uh, he was out in Klamath Falls. Uh, but I've met so many people like Phil that they just have tons of instruments. They don't sell them, they just have them because they make them, and they just keep making them and making them, and it's so wonderful. I just need to get more names. Um, another, and here's a list, Jerry Perret, who is uh, Ashland School's high school teacher for years, was somebody who studied under Victor and then went to the Chicago School of Violin Making and then she came back and taught. So she didn't make any more after that. Michael Scott, uh, we have some of his instruments. Uh, somebody from the Woodworking Guild that, oh, I like this. I, I wanna do this, this is beautiful, you know? Look at, look at the, you know, and, he, and he's not a player, but he makes beautiful <laughs> instruments, you'll see. Um, uh, uh, Fred, I don't know, um, but he's at the coast and he's doing it and I'm trying to keep in the area. Uh, David Gusset and Eugene and John Harrison have been the, the big shots on both sides of us. They are both world-class makers. Uh, David Gusset has won so many gold medals that it didn't allow him to compete anymore. And he's incredible. And John Harrison's ready. So like I've sent to Alex to, after he got back from Italy, okay, now go and hang out with Gusset. Now go hang out, you know, ask, take your instruments and get some feedback. And it's a constant loop there. Uh, yeah, and so many more. And I think that's it, isn't that it? Yep, good, great. So that ends that part of the show. Now we're going to look at some of these instruments and have Morgan, if we can get him going and get our extraordinary player uh, to demonstrate some things. So uh, why don't we, uh, why don't you grab a bow? Okay, yeah, question, please. You mentioned, you mentioned you know, yes. A lot of stuff from China comes Yes. Okay, well, let's go through a little bit real quick on finish. Every year I teach a finish class to the Siskiyou Woodcraft Guild, and it's, and it's, it's very esoteric. <laughs> there's, on a violin, there's two types of varnish. There's a spirit varnish, something that dries real quick, and there's an oil varnish, dries very slow, okay? They're both varnishes. Um, there's shellac, which is uh, like French polish. It's very great for finishing and everything. Um, it's very brittle for a violin, perhaps. So they put other things in it, other resins in it, so it's a little more elastic. Well, shellac is, okay, there's a bug that eats like plants, like fig trees and stuff, anyway, and it extrudes a house around itself. And so it's a sap that goes through its body and then it extrudes its house, and that's what it is. So it's more like propolis or something, like the bee eats the, and extrudes the propolis. So it's, but it's a highly resinous, and yeah, when you get it in the raw form, we get it in flake or, or stick lac or whatever, very raw forms, and yeah, it has bug heads in it and everything. <laughs> but it's, it's kept, it's, a, it's one of those um, rainforest products that there will always be there, and it's quite fascinating. Uh, and so most spirit varnishes are shellac based, so those, some of the older ones might have been um, juniper based. So that's another type resin like that. It's a little more brittle, so you need more elasticizers. The shellacs are kind of like the urusi or the shugu. Shugu is China, urusi is the Japanese, the lacquerware of, of Japan. Uh, but that's a very different thing. So that's like a poison oak, a sumac sap that uh, dries with moisture. So you can't have the allergy if you work on that stuff, on that lacquerware. But by the time we get the lacquerware, it's all set in. But it's quite an art in itself, and it's, it's very interesting. The oil varnish is, more, uh, is an older type of varnish and it's just cooking resins and oil. And it's John Hill once almost blew up his house. I mean, everybody almost does. We put Alex out in the parking lot and everybody complains because you gotta get it really hot. You gotta get it over 
300 degrees. I mean, ideally, you get it up to 500. We just don't have a hot plate that high. <laughs> but, and you cook oils and rosin together, okay? Highly explosive. And then there's elasticizers, things to get it to spread. Anyway, but um, this is, you know, there's, there's Alex's varnish, his oil varnish. Uh, different things, this is the coke, the coloring is um, um, uh, matter. So you take matter, um, it's a plant, and, and you grind it up and you mix it with a kim and cook it with, a, with some sort of, a, um, of something to get the color to stay. And that's, that's what... Yeah, yeah, you mix that in with your varnish, yeah, mini coats. Okay, so uh, let's see, let's go down in order of... Uh, oh, okay. Oh, Ernie Wickham, I didn't bring up Ernie. Ernie lives at the manor. He retired his, here. His son teaches, has an incredible fiddle program going in Ashland. A violin doesn't have to look like this is a violin. Even Stradivarius made violins without corners. One, we have one without corners. You don't need the corners, they're just extra. It could be just like a guitar, works fine. You want to, you want to try if you can do an Ernie tune on this? Um, uh, it sounds like it has steel strings on it. Fiddles. Typically, we're steel strung. Uh, it's a brighter sound. Carries more over the, you know, for dance hall music. doesn't carve the fiddles he bends the tops so he just he so it's just bent wood and rather than carved wood so a very different style and it's a kind of a uh, out west or, well whatever it's a, it's an American phenomena and the people, are, the people who do this are very opinionated <laughs> <laughs> anyway Ernie's a lovely guy lives at the manor he just donated all his a ton of instruments that he made to the youth symphony so that's so sweet of him yeah yeah Okay, so that, and that's, I would call, a fiddle. <laughs> um, and er, Ernie makes very, what we call, large violas. So violas traditionally came in two categories. The small ones and the big ones. And the big ones kind of got phased out over time because you would hurt yourself playing the thing. So it's like putting a coffee table up to your arm and then, you know, if you play a, long, play a two hour long Cavalli opera at the end, you have to go have your spine put back into place. So they, they weren't really that popular. So most violas, they made to the back length like, at around 16 inches, five lenses, 14 inches. But they were talking violas to the north of 18 or 19 inches. And Ernie made one. And it was incredible to play the thing. I, I, I met it once, it's like, <laughs> what is this? Put a hole in it, make it into a bar if you want to. But it has this incredible huge sound. And yeah, sure enough, after about three minutes, I was kind of like, uh, and, and, but, but his, er, Ernie's son stuck an in pen in it and plays it like a cello. So finally finds use for it. What have we got next? Okay, Michael Aaron Scott, Tacoma, Oregon, 2010. Michael's the one who, um, Decided to study with Michael Klein, never doesn't play. So this is a, f but incredible workmanship. You've got to look at the workmanship. Incredible wood worker. But, I mean, I think he plays now some, but um, anyway. So, so this violin is tuned to an eight, it's a little bit lower. I'm just going to let it go and not tune it up because there's this, there's this misconception that everything has to be played at this year. People say they have perfect pitch. Well, really, they have really good pitch memory for a certain frequency. Because back in the day, the local A was whatever the pipe organ was at. And so this is something for me as an artist. I went off to conservatory and I used to think, oh, I need to learn how to play in tune. And so I get up my guitar to it and put the needle exactly on the nose. And then everything. And so I put myself into this very small mindset. 
But since I've been getting more involved with JBO and learning all these things from Steve about historical instruments, I'm learning that you really need to be flexible as a performer to different A's because really back in the day, if you're going around Germany playing duets with a local organist, you couldn't tell them to please play in tune. You just had to kind of uh, play by house rules, so to speak. So this is from Tequilma. I'm going to play an old tune from where my family comes from, County Galway. And right across the bay is County Clare, which has this fantastic Irish fiddle tradition. And this is one of the very first tunes I learned uh, as a boy. Martin Hayes flew into Crescent City. He was an hour late because we were having typical Crescent City weather, you know, where the rain was coming sideways. And they took him in a taxi street from the airport, and he sat down all disheveled and played this. And this is the reason I got into Irish fiddle music. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful instrument. This bow, I guess, rotating the bow, is it changes the tone? Yeah, yeah, well, it's, it's a bit like, hmm, hmm. It's a bit like if you think of a turbocharger in a car. Right. You know, it mixes oxygen in. So there are 100, around 120 strands of force hair on this thing. And if I was to use all of them, well, hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah. You know, but so I can, I can. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Ernie's, Ernie's had. Ah, uh, gee. What do you see when you see blue? It's kind of you know we can get into that area area of philosophy. But Ernie's has what I call a bright sound. It's and it speaks very quickly. If you if like the moment you touch the instrument, it goes boom, and that's really great for dancing because you know, the fiddle preaches a little bit. You need you need it to be heard. 30 feet away through a bunch of people who were all doing this. 
that last one has a yeah, much lower let me, string let me see action. This for a second. And and so it also it also has a very quick response, but it has what I call I consider a much darker tone. It has it does it's it's not really an extroverted sort of sound. It, it's not bright, it's more interior. And it has probably if you were to take a spectral analysis of the sound, has a much stronger fundamental pitch and not as many overtones. And and that's really much it's much more fun as a performer because it, to work with those darker color palettes because those kinds of instruments, you can make them sound bright, but they also have a naturally darker voice. With, with naturally bright instruments, it's very hard, technically speaking, to get them to go dark. It's possible, but it's difficult. And it's, it's really, some of them are incredibly stubborn. It's like they have one way they sound, and that's it. And I, my, my personal instrument, my, my viola, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, is Italian. And the Italian instruments are notoriously stubborn and they're very temperamental. Uh, some days they sound awesome. Other days it's like, nope, non sono così stufo per te or per ogni altra persona. I won't sound good for you or anybody else. So what have we got next? Okay, Howard Sands, Eagle Point, uh, 2007, one of Victor's students. Mm. And that has a neck. Oh, the neck. The neck, we don't finish the neck because they used to, but your hand wears it out and the varnish grabs. So we typically strip it and then just have a, um, a light varnish on it, very, very light. Yeah, also, also playing on the neck that's been varnished is a bit like, it's a bit like um, trying to run across an ice skating rink. It's very slippery, so it, it's, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> instrument I get more of a feel from it that it has well I've seen the kinds of strings that it has on it which are so-called classical player strings so it's set up to be a bit more like a violin so maybe I'll just be classical on it. <laughs> so, so that was that was a tune which is uh, in Italian called the Capricca, Capriccio, from Capriccio, which is from Capriccio, and uh, that particular one changes key as it goes on. It's a lot of fun trying to keep track of it in your brain. Uh, but that that violin had, uh, if I was to say play a piece with an orchestra, like a concerto or a solo, where there's a whole lot of musicians that I need to cut through but still have a good quality sound, I would choose that one. Because it has a lot of power, what I call power to the sound, where it's, like, it's, it's almost like, like in, in a sort of almost a Harry Potter-esque moment, uh, where you, you feel something coming from the violin, and it's like, aha, it has this certain yeah, hidden power to it. But if I was going to be making a solo recording of you know, just me playing Bach, I would consider it almost too extroverted and brash. Like I would maybe go with the other one, which had a softer, darker voice. So what if we? Oh, we have a okay. So, okay. Problem. Well, the, <laughs> uh, the bow Morgan's yeah, so playing on. So, so this was also <laughs> this this bow was made in Bali by a wonderful man named Daryl Hanks, who's become a good friend of mine. He Daryl started off as a fishing guide, came here from East Texas after his family had had enough book burnings and exorcisms to try and get him to follow the good, goodly path. And it didn't work. <laughs> so he came here and then he started fishing, guiding, and making very, very nice fly rods. And he met David Dunn and says, can you help me make a violin? David at this point 
didn't really want any competition, so he said, why don't you learn how to make bows instead? Mm -hmm. And so then he got into bow making. This is an early example of his. Daryl is now making world-class bows up in Portland. I got lucky I had him make me two bows before he moved. And he literally made them for me. He got to know my playing for about a year before he made these bows. And it was, it was like, oh, when, <laughs> when I grabbed the bow, it's like, oh, that's what it's supposed to do. And this is, this is a whole new experience for me. It was, it's, it's, it's almost like having a, an extension of your brain out to your hand. It just follows everything you want to do when a bow is made for you. Okay. Yes, it is. R rare South American hardwood in the Pernambuco. There's, there's a moratorium on cutting it, uh, but thankfully Daryl has a giant garage full of Pernambuco. I know I helped him move it on at least two occasions. <laughs> I know exactly how much Pernambuco he has. It's very heavy wood, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and it's bent. It's actually, the wood starts off straight, and then you, he, he does something called cambering. He, he holds the wood over a, a alcohol lamp, gets it hot, and then bends it over his desk. Mm. And the camber is actually very specific to the wood. Each, each, each piece of wood is different. So you work with the camber and get the bow to act as a consistent unit. Ideally, what you want to do is that when you draw it, it's a perfect, perfectly smooth bow. There's no one part of it that goes, or, or bounces or wobbles or just anything eccentric. Okay, there's a little note on here that, that points out that the maple here is from Tepper, from Shady Cove. Okay. These guys, you go to Tepper's and we go, we bought some wood in there recently and he says, oh yeah, that tree, that's so, that came from over in that. You know, he knew every tree, every piece of wood we looked at. Oh yeah, that tree. <laughs> it was amazing. He knew exactly where they grew, each tree. Um, this is by Vict Victoria e Gardinere, so he Italianized his name. And uh, anyway, uh, 1973. Watch too many spaghetti westerns. There you go. And it's a violin bow, so if Morgan had a viola bow, we'd be rocked out of the house. Oh, uh, we violists, we love the steel repertoire, so all of uh, this particular piece was stolen from the cellist. Uh, I think it would suit the instrument, this, this instrument, quite well.
That was written by Bach. This is a D minor prelude to his uh, second cello suite, the only one that he wrote in minor. No, actually, I lied. He also wrote a C minor one that has a really incredible fugue, which is incredibly difficult to play, which is why I chose to play it on this one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the viola has that darker, richer quality. It takes a bit more, the strings are thicker, the body's bigger, it takes a bit more oomph to get going sound wise. So it's a different technique. And it's one that I'm more suited to. Every once in a while, I pick up a violin and I forget that it's a violin and I squish the poor thing because I play it like it's a viola. <laughs> Somebody in the national who has one in their in her closet, and and when when I found out she had it, I said, "Don't you know what this is?" And it was a real pleasure to get to meet it and play it. What do we have next? Okay, this is John Hills. Uh -huh. So, uh, 2006, John Hill. This is a first first one. Well, I think it might be the first one he one of his professional instruments that he sold locally. So, mm. this is John Hill. yeah, I met John Hill in 2006. So Morgan almost bought a John Hill viola. But instead, he bought this silly one from Italy for thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. yeah, I decided I didn't have enough money for the local guy, so I, I and I gave it back to him. And then a year later, I sold stock in a viola to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> but the reason I ended up ultimately not getting the John Hill viola is it, it was fantastic. Uh, it, res it spoke, it responded, it has even registers all the way across. But I put it in front of an orchestra, and it just couldn't cut through. So ultimately, uh, if I was to spend a lot more of my life playing chamber music and solo, uh, just like so solo albums and things without any other musicians, I would go get that viola and use it in a heartbeat. But as it happened, I needed something that had a bit more of a gangbuster bite to it. Uh, but let's see. I made, I made a guess which turned out to be pretty much correct. Which I know John has these instruments that have an incredibly sweet tone to them. Something that is, it, it's, it's silvery, it's a little, it's a little bit, um, it's very delicate, it's very sweet, and uh, not the most powerful tone, so I chose a piece to match. But if I, wanted, if I wanted to, I bet I could get something darker out of this instrument. This is in uh, Bosnian maple, so that's the preferred maple. That's what Stradivarius Amadis use, the ma maple out of uh, Bosnian. 
and beautiful. So Eastern, uh, compared to the others, they've all been local wood. This is European wood. Um, probably uh, some Alp, Swiss Alps or something. I don't know what the spruce is. Okay. Um, now this next instrument uh, is by um, uh, David Sliger. And it was made in Arcade in 1988. So it's not our area, but it's kind of an interesting local instrument. Uh, extremely well executed. Very, very hard to find a flaw in it. It's just like number two from him or something. Like yes, that. it's, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, so it's, oh, I think it's number three of his. Is an aerospace engineer. He, he studied with the two best, I said on both, David Gusset up in Eugene. And then there's another maker I haven't mentioned, uh, uh, Joseph Grumbach down in Petaluma. And they really, I mean, Joseph and his wife are in business and they, they're the ones that repair Strauss. They're the ones that mean the, the important people in the Bay Area and their, make, their instruments probably go for 40 or 50,000. Uh, incredible, but he studied with them both. Nobody's ever done that. He's in his 20s. He couldn't get more than 15 for him. He says, well, this, this is, I can't do this. And so he quit, went to Berkeley, got his doctorate as a, and was professor there for many years. And now he lives in Grants Pass. So he's local. <laughs> but for a third instrument, this is unbelievable. <laughs> what? It's in, it's in the shop. We don't own it. No. It's for sale. You want to buy it? <laughs> well, wait. Here, you got to hear it. <laughs> the, the moment I met this violin is about three years ago. It was kind of like, oh. oh. I want that one. <laughs> and I told him, I said, if I had 10,000 bucks, I'd give it to you right now, but I don't. That's the, and a good friend of mine, Kevin Carr, who's a local, local uh, wizard uh, of many instruments, he has what his wife lovingly calls bad gas. Gear acquisition syndrome. <laughs> and then I got equally bad gas. <laughs> but he has like 80 bagpipes, so I, I think I've heard him. So this has what I consider a very traditional first violin sound. It's bright, it's sunny, it's, it's, it, it's projecting, it has a bit of zing to it, uh, but it, it still has enough versatility to be able to be very expressive. Uh, if I was playing string quartets like Mozart or, or Mendelssohn or Haydn or Shostakovich, I would want this violin. Let's see. Case in point. But it also, let's see, I bet you I could also play some Scottish fiddle on it because the this, this Scottish fiddle is actually somewhat more connected to classical traditions than, than some of the other traditions. So you can.
great pleasure to play on this violin is that it really it, it goes faster than I can. <laughs> and, you know, some violins it's like you know, they, they reach like a bit of a threshold of response, like you can only push them to go so loud or so fast, or or uh, so soft or so so whatever. This one, I've yet to find its limits. Yeah. It's found my limits, but I haven't found its limits. And if anybody would like to donate ten thousand dollars, <laughs> okay. This this is by Young Alex. Uh, does he label it? No, he has. He just made this one. Uh, so this is right off the press. It usually does take a like a good wine. It takes a little bit of time to. Uh, open up and everything on, on any of these instruments. Uh, a, a good year would be good, but anyway, so this one's brand new, uh, hot off the press, and um, let's, see, let's see what we can get. So as I mentioned earlier, I have this Italian viola that uh, I own 13 35ths of it right now, <laughs> and uh, I'm currently distracted from paying it off because I had Alex copy it. He had never made a viola before, he liked my viola, so He's this really funny, quiet guy with this, with this kind of interesting way of talking. He says, let me try to make a copy of yours. <laughs> and I says, okay, well, this one, only on one condition. I want it to be a Baroque viola. All right, I'll be the first person in history to make a Baroque copy of a modern viola. <laughs> <laughs> and he did it, and it's amazing. This instrument, uh, so, so the only difference between a Baroque setup, as we call it, and a modern setup, is really the strings are made of gut, these are made of steel. And the neck, uh, so the fingerboard is shorter on a Baroque instrument because you don't really need to be up in the nosebleed section of the violin for that repertoire. And also the neck is a bit fatter uh, to accommodate a slightly different technique. Uh, and, and, and in general, they're kind of lighter construction. So he made this beautiful Baroque viola for me. And we've become good friends over the process. And I'm really glad that I can in that case, support a local maker, just like I did with Daryl, because I, I, I think Steve's right. Alex has this huge, bright future ahead of him, and he needs. Let's see, he's made what six now? Well, that, since he's been back. No, he's seven. He's, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, so he's, he's working made, on eight. He's made my viola. He's made five violins that I can think of. Well, he's, yeah, he made three or he made four at school. They keep so the Cremona school is free if you can get in. <laughs> But you got to speak Italian, and you got to get in, and uh, and they keep all your instruments, and you can buy back something. Oh. <laughs> so he had to. <laughs> so, yes. yeah. so many mafiosi. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> so, so let's see. It's like, it's like it's hard to think what to play on this thing to do it justice. Uh, I'll play this in the wrong key. Sorry, then.
Just, just, so, so for years and years and years and years and years, everybody used gut strings or steel strings. And then uh, right around the 1940s, a company in Austria, uh, or maybe 50s, started experimenting with synthetic cores. So they, in this case, they used nylon. And that's the same company, Dominant, so the first ones. So there's a whole, uh, the generation of string players one up from me. This was the only string that they knew, so they all play on Dominant's. And they're just kind of the universal beat all workhorse string. And uh, I don't personally like them as much, but they work well on this violin. And so, so it's a nylon core with steel winding. And in this case, the E string is actually gold plated. Uh, well, the, and the G is, is uh, silver wound. Yeah. yeah. But as I know about these, uh, so Alex, is, Al Alex and John Hill's violins are what I consider, from my standpoint as a player, to be the most versatile of the violins. Yeah, they can really do anything. In fact, uh, also David Sliger's violin. Uh, but but if if you were to ask me which one of these fiddles I would want to go with, I'd have to say all of them for one aspect or another. <laughs> but uh, I think that I would have the easiest time with this one or the Sliger. And I know Alex has been getting into Irish music lately, so in his honor, I'd like to play a little Irish tune on this to show you what else it can do. bring one of Michael Klein's cellos but I didn't bring a cello bow so but look at it it's beautiful and it does sound wonderful now um, something oh, else yeah, I about from this. the Schumann collection um, this is a very interesting the Schumann collection has a lot of hidden jewels and this is one of them we call this for years the viola di braccio the viola of the arm um, has six strings um, but what was but we it just didn't sound any good. It just didn't sound right, so we, nobody thought much of it. Uh, earlier this year, I went up to uh, Salem to visit um, William Monocle. William Monocle used to, he's retired, lives with his son up in Salem, and uh, used to live on the East Coast and be one of the foremost experts on historic bowed strings. Uh, and I took this to him, and he got excited. And now I'm excited. I took a couple of them, but this one he really got excited. This is uh, is what it says it is, which is rare. Johannes Schoen, um, uh, Lotten, uh, uh, Geigen maker. So that's what he is, Luton Geigen maker. Uh, Salzburg, 1711. It's incredible shape. We have done restoration on it and repair and stuff. And uh, but it was missing something, and it had gut strings wound on the bottom and solid gut on the top. And Bill says, well, that's, that's the early viola de more. Now, a viola de more is an instrument like this with a neck that tall and all sorts of sympathetic strings, strings that free vibrate, that go underneath the bridge, 
like Kevin, a sitar. Kevin has one. Yes, okay. it, and well, Olaf has the one. I made one for Olaf. And anyway, they're uh, interesting, ringy sound. Well, he said this one had metal strings, and he showed me, you know, in the text where, and we'd never heard this instrument. Nobody, we all know it. Exi well, a handful of people who know about the viola de Moor, which kind of came around 1730 and stuff. Uh, they kind of know about this from the literature, but where there's not recorded, you can't hear a recording of it. And so we put the, I have, uh, there was a gentleman in town who ran a harpsichord supply business for years, since the 60s, Lutz Berngarten. He passed on and kind of inherited his business. My son's running the next door, but it's harpsichord supply. So voila, harpsichord strings. So. So it's tuned to an open chord. This is Han, uh, a Bieber, Bieber uh, composer at the time wrote specifically for this tuning, uh, a cacciatura tuning, open tuning. Um, so. So there it is. Now, it's the first time it's ever been recorded. <laughs> um, obviously, Morgan's just coming that out, coming with that out of his soul. No, they're never as loud as violins, but they weren't meant to be. You know, it's a, it was more of a personal type of instrument. Anyway, very interesting. Uh, we're very proud to have that in the collection. Yeah. Ho hopefully, I'll get to actually learn how to play that thing. Uh, yes, question. Uh, ah, yes, this is a Baroque book. Uh, so, but as, as I said, hopefully I'll get to play that uh, with Jamie Yo in the next year. I think the director of Peggy Grease has plans for it, and hopefully me, but we'll see. It's, it's, a, it's very different because it has six strings, and so for me it's a bit like, I don't know, I suppose it's a bit, a bit like if you can all imagine going down to the hospital and having a third leg stitched on here and going to go to the dance or something. Yeah, it's about that, about that straightforward. This bow is a Baroque bow, and uh, the stylistic, it's a, it's a bit like the difference between having a Mack truck and a Dodge Viper. So this being the Mack truck. The modern bow is designed to sustain and to get power and to bounce also, uh, and, and to do all the great things that orchestral playing requires, to be able to blend, to play off the string, to play fast play slow. The Baroque bow, uh, the, ca the, the camber, the bend, is the other way. And so it's designed to come off the string. And to, and to make very quick, agile, flying move motions and movements. It's not really the greatest if you, you, know, you need to play Wagner with this thing, forget it. <laughs> but playing Vivaldi, playing uh, Bach, playing any of those early pieces works wonderfully. And yeah, it's a bit like having a Dodge Viper. Oh, it does everything. <laughs> so one day, uh, we had this group coming into town, Vice, uh, Vassen. Vessen. Vessen, excuse me. And um, they play Swedish music, and we decided, to, well, let's open up the shop for workshops. We had a couple of the, we had people over there in the tool shop, the saw shop, other people. And we just moved all, everything aside and got everybody in the shop and did this workshop. The night before, I put an instrument like this from the collection in Morgan's hand, and I said, you're playing this <laughs> tomorrow. I said, what so, the hell do I do? <laughs> So, of course, my typical suggestion is go to YouTube. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I should not put on my 100-word on my bio on my website that I study with YouTube. It's very true. It's, 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 it's go on there and monkey see, monkey do sort of approach. But yeah, this instrument, uh, Vesen is a wonderful band. In Sweden, they're a four-piece band. In America, they're a three-piece band because their drummer is afraid of airplanes. So, so they were they were very kind and generous and came by and uh, I learned learned my first polska, which is a Swedish dance. I don't know how many of you 
caught the uh, wonderful radio show that was produced by a friend of his in the corner yesterday. I told him I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this and the my, the extent of my first nickel harpa lesson was this great big tall Swedish guy comes over and says, "You should always have a thing you." because I realized he was very right. It has a, it's a keyboard instrument. So when you hit the wrong key, you really know. Anyways. <laughs> so let's see, I think I'll, I'll play my first. What is that called? A what? The instrument. Oh, it's called a nickel harpa, oh. which means it's translates to mean fiddle the keyboard stuck to it. <laughs> and there are many, many jokes about nickel harpa players because they all come from the same region. So all, all uh, inbreeding aside, all the nickel harpa players and the fiddle players all kind of sit in different places in jam sessions and they each have their own repertoire. The nickel harpa repertoire is really hard to play on violin because it has all these arpeggios that are naturally suited to the instrument. So I'll play something from early from a 19th century nickel harpa repertoire called The Building by this guy, Bruce Kawa, who was one of the few people who played both fiddle and nickel harpa, but obviously he preferred nickel harpa. <laughs> <laughs> it has three melody strings covering three octaves, and then one bass string, which you just sort of tune to whatever the note du jour is, uh, based on the jam session. I keep it on D because most Irish musicians play a D. In Sweden, they like C a little bit more, uh, but sometimes you tune it to A or down to A or up to B. It all depends. And then there are all these funny little strings cut into the bridge, which are called resonance strings. So every time I play a note that's the same note as any one of these, it vibrates along sympathetically. So you're not actually playing the note. You can hear it, yeah. Yeah, that's why it's and got that's, such a great tone. Yeah, yeah, it's, like, it's a bit like carrying your own castle around with you, yes. How does uh, touching one of the keys affect the sound, either mm -hmm. strings going across Oh, no. so, so the string is this long. If I touch a key, it pushes a little piece of wood into the string, which now makes it that long. So, so the keys, so the keys are attached to these little dowels, which move, which are called tangents because they only touch the string at one point. And it's essentially, it's essentially like exactly the same thing as I'm doing on the violin by putting my fingers on the strings. Except here, I put in my fingers on the keys, which are putting the strings instead. And so, there, therefore, you get a really sound. But you can't do any sliding because it's only yes, on or off. Yeah. It's not a blue. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well yes, in the in the ideal world it would be a more baroque type bow. 
uh, but uh, the gas has not blown that away from me yet. Yeah. Uh, this, this is a 1 16th size violin bow <laughs> that I got from a certain violin shop in Ashland. <laughs> and, yes, yes, yes. And, uh, well, here, show them why you don't want to use a longer bow. Yeah, yeah, He's the reason I don't want to use a longer bow is, uh, you know, <laughs> I have to be playing to my, uh, yes. That's a long yeah, this is a modern instrument, yes. Mm -hmm. The nickel harpa goes back to the earliest one we have is from the 15th century, uh, the, the, the resistance. And their stone carvings in churches that date to 1200 uh, are around there in Sweden that have photos of little inbred men having midlife crises. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so this, but this, this is the 20th century version that has the fully chromatic keyboard. The earlier ones had uh, a, an interesting locking key system where you push the key and it hits several strings at once, almost like an auto harp. So then you just kind of go walking around playing chords with yourself. That didn't really help the image of it being a primitive, primitive instrument. And the earlier ones also had bass string in the middle. So, and a melody string on either side. So you just kind of scrubbed away on the thing. And every note that you played sounded good. And it had this funny bass string in the middle that would give it this kind of whoop, 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 whoop sound. And, and uh, that tradition almost completely died until a musicologist uh, uh, named Jon Ling in Sweden. I have his book, I'm reading it, it's fascinating. He found the last two old timers in Ulsterbybruk, the same village that I bought this one in, who played in this old style. And at first they refused to play for him because he, they just assumed he'd be making fun of them for the, you know, your backwards hicks playing an old fiddle. But he, he had finally, finally insisted, insisted, and we only have one recording. And uh, that, that's the one that he made, and I've been driving around in my Volvo listening to it. We'll figure out of this old older nickel harvest style and of course that that's only one there are only about that's only one variety there are about six or seven different kinds of nickel harvest this is the fully chromatic one as i said uh, but it's a really interesting instrument and this one was made uh two years ago by by a maker who was a judge at this in, instrument making contest and he was a judge because he had won too many times in the past, just like some of our friends. And I asked him if being a judge was a blessing or a curse, and he laughed and didn't really respond. Uh, but he made his first one for his wife back when he had... In, in Sweden, the joke, one of the many nickel harpa jokes is that you make one when you have your midlife crisis. You quit your job at the forge, you go into the woods, and you buy the Jan Ling book, and you build a very bad nickel harpa and you come over and hang it on the fireplace. This is why there are 10,000 nickel harpa players in Sweden. <laughs> and that's about how many midlife crises there have been since the 60s, I think. Uh, this guy had his midlife crisis, and the first one, yeah, he told me it was very bad, but by the time he got on the number 37, they're really, really good. And his wife, he, he, made, he made it for his, his first one for his wife, because he's a violist and he wanted to be able to play duets with her, but she never really took to it. He got really, really addicted. And then of all the things, I went and found this one, and then my friend Olaf, the, the magical Swedish fiddle player who lives in a barn in Tallinn, one of our great cultural trader tropes, this sweet man, went to Sweden and bought another one from the same maker. So now we have two matched nickel harpas from Busa Carlson <laughs> here, here in the Rose Valley. Uh, uh, yeah. I saw someone in Ashland last year busking one. Oh, yeah. I've never seen, seen yeah, What is that? Thing? Yes. One. Yes, exactly. Oh. It might have been me. <laughs> it's probably all off. It's probably all off. <laughs> so, yeah, that's essentially how the Nickel Harbor works. Um, there are, as I said, 10,000 players in Sweden, about 12 of us on the West Coast. And in honor of the tradition, I actually wrote some Swedish music for the town of Mill Valley. I decided that Mill Valley needed a folk music tradition. Uh, and so, with your indulgence, I know I've talked way too much. I'd like to play the first tune that I wrote for the Mill Valley Folk Commission in the style of the Swedish music for you. And in, in, in Mill Valley, there's a, there's a trail that goes to Stimson Beach. It's called the Dipsy Trail. And I hiked that trail with some friends, and one of them took a bunch of photos with my camera of the, the sort of Marin County landscapes. And so I wrote pieces for each one of these photos. And this one is actually a photo of the beginning of the Dipsy Steps as they call it. It's this little staircase through the redwoods out of Mill Valley, up into the marine headlands. And, and this particular photo is you can see the stairs vanishing up into the redwoods in the mist. And so that's where this tune came from. <laughs>
Martin O'Shaughnessy, fiddler extraordinaire. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There will, I assume, be a petting zoo to follow? Yeah, you could come up and look. <laughs> and we'll, of course, gladly love to chat and answer any more questions or share stories or go fika, as we say in Sweden, which is to eat coffee and sugary cakes. <laughs> <laughs> Who brought the coffee and sugary cakes? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.